Washington. Lord God, just thank you that it's time that we can spend time with Louise, Lord, a, a sister in the Lord, a family, where Jesus said two or three are gathered together. I welcome you, Lord Jesus, that I will speak right. Lord, I pray for Roberto, Lord, that he come out of his shell. Lord, come out for you. And Lord, just bless this time, Lord. May I not say anything wrong. May I not be in pride. May I be in the word of you, Lord. May you be pleased. Lord, that if you were to rapture us right now, Lord, I would hear, well done. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. I haven't moved down off the first column John in my Bible yet. Mm -hmm. So we've learned much in 13 verses. I don't I didn't write it down because 1030 came up real quick. I mean, I didn't see how many lessons we're doing. But we've done many subjects. And like I said, I'm in no rush to complete. I want to make sure we get the Word of God fullest to the fullest that we can get it. And it says in verse 14, and the Word, capital W, was made flesh. That's the incarnate. That's Jesus Christ in the flesh being God. But we've already looked at that. God came down from heaven, born of a virgin, and became a literal man. He's 100% man, he's 100% God, 100% God, 100% man. Jehovah Witnesses and Unitarians have a problem with that. I don't. I don't know how it happened, but I don't have a problem with it. There's a lot of things in life I don't understand, but you know, you, you just have faith to do it. I don't know how this picnic table can hold me up, but I'm not going to get into the physics. I'm going to say, I'm going to sit down, unless it's rusty or broken, it's going to hold me up. I know God is not rusty, I know God's not broken, and He's going to hold me up. He showed me time and time and over again. So the Word was made flesh. So the Word is God, and God is flesh, and dwelt among us. Among the writer, looking at singular John, the son of Zebedee, says that that Word was, was a man, and he dwelt, I dwelt with that Word, I lived with God. And John is the one that leaned upon the breast of God. I don't know if he could hear his heartbeat, and if he could hear the heartbeat, he heard the heartbeat of God. If not, he could feel the motions of God breathing through his holy lungs. God had lungs. God had a physical heart. And, parentheses, is a note. Big note. And he, and we... Peter, James, John, everybody that lived with Jesus, beheld his glory. We saw him. Peter, James, and John on the Mount Transfiguration, which we'll get to, maybe, <laughs> the way we're going, maybe we'll get in heaven, saw Jesus Christ manifested as the light, capital L, before God, Moses, and Elijah, that no one else saw him. Nine Disciples did not see Jesus in his holy state. Only Peter, James, and John did. And John, the writer of the gospel, can write further because Peter, James, and John were the, of the inner circle that saw things many of the nine did not see. And John speaks about the first John. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, capital F. Now, we are born of God through Jesus Christ, but there's only one born of God. And the Mormons teach that Satan and Jesus are brothers, and the only way you could be brothers is you've got to be born. So they would have to teach in their doctrines that Satan was also born. No, he was created, Ezekiel 28. He the only, uh, Ezekiel says, the anointed chariot that I created. So, you got to watch out with your little saying that can go against the Scriptures. But as a physical birth of God, it's only been Jesus Christ. I've been spiritually born. I've been born again. And Jesus says in John chapter 3, hopefully we'll get to that sometime, is if you're born of a woman, the water birth, well, you need a spiritual birth. 
And that water birth of Jesus, we're told in Luke, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary and that thing became Christ. Full of grace. That's well, not me. Christ in the flesh, there's always Christ before. Full of grace. I may have grace, but I may not be full of grace. I may have off days. And Christ had off days. Christ Jesus is suffering agony beyond much pain we can describe. And the Bible says, still on the cross with agony and going to die, John says, full of grace. Catch me on an off day, I don't think I'm going to be very much full of grace. And truth. Well, I hope I'm going to tell the truth, but at that moment that you're going to be in trouble, you don't know what your lips are going to spill out. And there, I thank God there have been times, many times, where I've been chewed out by a boss and, you know, caught, you know, walked by the office, finally come in here, I've got to ask you something, and that question is going to get me in trouble. I thank God I answered that question correctly. But I realize sometimes, you know, being a father to, to my daughter, there's sometimes there's some things I say that, you know, they're not the truth. To get a giggle and try to get a laugh. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, there is no lie. The other day I put, God cannot lie, God will not lie, God is unable to lie, and Jesus Christ fit that, full of truth. And when I dealt with the Jehovah Witness, I said, listen, you believe Jesus is sinless. And all through marriage, five minutes, his him, his church, his mother, whoever, all your Jehovah Witnesses said, Jesus is God, right? I mean, Jesus is sinless. Then he has to be God. And if Jesus Christ is full of truth and never, and never, and never, and never told a lie, he has to be God because we all lie. We lie about ourselves. We look, how good I am. Well, God's like looking inside us like, not right now, you're not. Because I see you as a sinner. I see some unconfessed sin that you may not even see yet. So grace is favor, it's goodwill, it's kindness, free unmerited love and favor of God. Full of grace. I have turned down some homeless people. And sometimes I felt bad, sometimes I'm wondering, did that person really know? But can you find a life of Jesus Christ where he ever turned anybody down? Even Judas, that Jesus knew that Judas was coming to betray his friend. Do you realize that moment when, when Judas said, okay, that's it. You know what? I've sinned. I have sinned against God. Do you realize instead of going to the priest, if he ran and found Jesus and said, Jesus, listen, I am so sorry. Jesus would have forgave him. And life would be so much different. If Pilate were going up to that cross and said, Jesus... I really believe, and I am sorry that I gave that sentence. Christ would have forgave him. You say, that's impossible. Is not Jesus in agony? Is he not in pain? And he says to that thief, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Uh, grace, even in agony of his body, when they say you're being crucified, your body is, is drowning in your own body fluids. He has free will and he's offering a free gift to the, to the repentant thief that's right next to him. And he's dying himself. Mm. How are we doing? Can you imagine a circumstance that, uh, you know, let's say we've been hit by a drunk driver and we're both in our car wreck and we're just a mangled piece of, of a pretzel. And we're both about to die. I, I don't know if I would even have enough grace to be like, hey, guy over there, you, I'd be upset that he put me in an instant. I don't know. I have no idea. In death, Jesus Christ had grace for a dying man. He would have grace again for Pilate and for the nation. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's grace. Stephen, when he dies, he says all the same words, but first, Father, receive my spirit, I think it was. Even Stephen thought of himself before he thought about the people who were stoning him and chewing him out, literally. Not Jesus, he's all about the people. 
So 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. And we come to another part of our thing. Grace. Grace, grace, marvelous grace. You do not want me to sing anymore. Grace, again, is favor, goodwill, kindness, free, unmerited love, and favor of God. Of God. There could be people who are treating you right and doing you right, and it's not because of love, because they want something from you. It's a possibility. I'm not saying all people like that, but I'm saying there's that possibility. But God is free. It's love. The love of God is grace. Verse 9. And he said unto him, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now look at verse 7 about what Paul is talking about. At least I should exalt my above measure through the abundance of the revelation. There was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to buffet me, and I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I sought the Lord thrice, three times, that it might depart from me. God allows Satan to attack Paul so to keep him from being prideful. And Paul has gone to God and said, God, this hurts. Stop it. Please. God, I can't stand it. I need your help. God, oh. My grace is sufficient for you. Did he get rid of it? Absolutely not. Here's a grace, unparable love. Is you're going to have agony, you're going to have health problems, Paul, but I'll help you. Paul's like, if you just take care of it, Lord, please remove it, and then you'll be prideful and you'll sin against me and you'll go away from me and I won't, cannot use you to your full. But I'll give you grace. What is that? I'll give you help, but I'm not going to eliminate. It. And we need to realize in our lives that, God, stop it! No. Because if I stop it, you're going to go away. And I love you. You're my son. I'm your father. The best thing you need to do is keep on doing it. I'll give you grace to go through it. I'll give you help. And sometimes that best help that God gives you through those troubles and Tracy, you know, is that that's the best help. Then you get the peace of God that the Holy Spirit gives you. It's a lot better to have in that than going walking off like demons did into the world. It's a lot better to ruin your whole life and then go to glory and you ain't got nothing to show. Paul's going to get a lot of rewards. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We're going to look at some verses here together. Three verses. It's going to be Ephesians 2 and then in Romans. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Grace. For by grace, free unmerited love. How much did you suffer for salvation? None. What did you have to give God to be saved? Nothing. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, least any man should boast. Grace is what got you saved. It is the free, unmerited love given by God for you to be children of God, like the beloved Son, Jesus Christ, who is full of grace. Romans 6.14 And I'm old enough to know, I've, I've known a few women who were named Grace. But it was a common name. Mm -hmm. you got to be careful how you name your children, because you're going to name a child Grace, and you don't know how they're going to turn out. They may be graceless. Mm -hmm. uh, Romans 6, 14. All right, we're going to, all right, everyone gather around the table, let's say Grace. What is that? Blessing to me. But, Free, married, unmarried love of God. 
I, I just really think you're just full of love and care when you made that dinner on a hot summer day. Or you know, it's no, it's not grace. It's thanking God. There's a difference. Grace is not thanking God. When you say, "Let's say grace," you're, you know, you're going to thank God. That's not. You've changed the definition. Grace is that unmerited love that, if without it, I'd be lost and going to hell. And lost in hell, God would still have grace. Because there are plenty of people in hell today that refuse the grace. Romans 6.14 For sin shall not have dominion over you. It's not going to overcharge you. Ye are not under the law, but under grace. So the law is not grace, and the grace is not law. You could be right 59 years in the law. And that 60th year is sin against God and law and still die and go to hell. That's bad. The law says you're the sinner. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Don't do this, thou shalt not. God says, come unto me, all you heavy laden. The law. I will give you grace. I will love you. I will accept you who you are. Yeah. Oh, you're a liar? That's okay. I'll take you. I'll welcome all liars. That's grace. These people in our government, oh, you know, we want to care for the, for the criminals. We want to let you all. All right, take them in your house. Show them grace. I'd like them in your house and let them stay in your house. Oh, you can't do that. And you have no grace. I'm not saying I'm going to do it. Well, I'm not full of grace. Do you realize if you really look at it, the science of the fact is that we are washed from our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. But if we were to show the details of what we are, of the sinners we are, you know, look at all the sins that people are of that got saved. Every single sin that has ever been committed is in the, is in the body of Jesus Christ. It's just been washed. That's grace. Now, people think, all are going to heaven. Imagine everybody going to heaven with their sins, without the grace, and without being washed, and without being regenerated. That's going to be some heaven. It's called the second earth. Second world. Oh, they want to, pop up, they want to uh, populate Mars and Saturn's moon. You're only going to have the same thing you have here. War, death, and tragedy. And, de and homelessness. First thing you'll find on Mars will be people living on the street when you build them. Because there's no grace. Grace is the one here. I'll take you. Romans 11, 6. Romans 11, 6. So if you have a works system of salvation, you don't have a grace. 11, 6. And if by grace, then it is no more grace of work. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. No more. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So if you're dealing with somebody saying, well, my work will get me to heaven, then, okay, what about grace? Oh, yeah, grace. No, <laughs> you're lying. Because Paul says grace contradicts the, the, the law, and the law contradicts grace. They're not the same. Christ said to me, April 21st, 1987, you want to be saved? You don't want to go to hell? You believe in the Lord Jesus? What do I bring you? You don't bring me nothing. I am offering to you as a very free gift. I will even wash you of your sins. Come unto me. What do I have to do? Nothing. Now, if God said, go do this, go do that, go this, there's no more grace because I earned it. So grace means I don't earn it. I don't work for it. It's the free, unmerited love that God has given me. And there's nothing I can do. Now, I do works because of grace. Listen, when a man marries a woman, a woman marries a man, it's not you give them anything. And with that love, hey, I'm giving you myself, and you don't have to give me anything back. That's a grace. Now, if you marry into lust and you want something from that person, there is work, you know. So marriage pictures, grace, when you've got a true loving thing, is I'm going to look out for you and you don't really have to do anything for me. 
Isn't that what God's love is for me? I'll take you in the family. And even you backslide and go do what most wicked things. I am not going to forsake you. I am not going to leave you. You're just not going to get no rewards. But that's great. And then, okay, let's see if I do do right. And God's going to offer me crowns and rewards and inheritance. Well, you did works. Yeah, but the, Jesus said that the fact is, it's not what we did, it is our duty to do it. I mean, we ought to be doing what God told us to do because of what He's done for us. I mean, you love your spouse because they love you back. It's grace. You don't have to do nothing. You don't have a law of marriage. And yet there's marriages like that out there. Romans 5.8. Romans 5.8. So, the answer, how, how do you know, you, or what will get you into heaven? Well, you know, I go to church. That ain't it. Mm -hmm. What makes you think you're going to go to heaven? Oh, I remember I was baptized. That ain't it. Mm -hmm. What's going to get you into heaven? Jesus. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel that he suffered and died and was buried and rose again, according to the scriptures, for me. Absolutely nothing I've done. It's his love. And when you preach the gospel, they may say, well, you don't have love. Hey, you are so far from what love is. It's not love to tell you, oh, you can do whatever you want, join whatever church you like, and do whatever you think, because God just loves everybody. I'd be goo. I'd be like a pot of uh, peanut butter sitting on the sidewalk in the middle of a hot summer day in the desert. Because that's gooey goochiness that ain't going to get you nowhere. Pain, suffering, love of God that Jesus Christ suffered. But God commended His love, remember the love, grace, free, unmerited love, toward us, in that, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I wasn't even around. Christ loved me enough when I wasn't even around that He knows what I'm going to do already. He says, I'm going to, you're going to spend the 18 most miserable years of your life without me. You're going to go to this perverted church. You're going to probably cuss my name. I know I probably did that. And then after I say, you're going to spend about a year, two years away from me. You're going to try to be a Christian, but you're not. And I love you. Here's my gift. And there's been some vile, wicked sins in my life. I won't tell nobody. Christ knows. Christ said, oh, what is that you did? Yeah, Lord, I'm guilty. Okay, I'll offer you a pardon. A pardon can only be given if you're guilty. That's grace. If you go walk, if the governor, I forget who he is, of Florida, goes walking into any prison today and says, listen, are you guilty of the crime? No, 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 it's, it's this thing, kind of thing. No, I, I was, are you guilty of the crime? No, it was the police. The police are against me. Are you guilty? No, no, it's a black thing. He walks in the next one and says, are you guilty of the crime that you're here? Oh, yes. Yes, you, you governor. I, I, I did it. I just outright did it. Warden, come over here, open that door, and give that guy a pardon. Grace comes by who we say we are, sinners. Grace does not come to the person, oh, I'm okay, I'm a good person, look how great I am. That doesn't happen. You have to admit who you... And that's, churches today are not pre preaching that repentance. Just ask Jesus in your heart and say this prayer and God loves you. Cock-a-poo-poo. You do. Because that's not so. What would it say? God committed His love toward us that while we were yet sinners, Christ saved me the sinner, not the unsinner. You know the requisite for you to receive the grace of God is you've got to be a sinner. You can't find them in churches today. They're too good. 
So grace is not the law. Grace is, are you a sinner? Are you filthy? Yes. Hi, I can help you. You know, you know what grace is? And, and, and I'm, I'm not for a person with doctors. But if you go sit down before a doctor's office and you sit down in his chair and he's sitting there, grace is, ma'am, I've looked at your diagnosis and I've looked at your x-rays, I've looked at everything, the blood, all the tests. Are you willing to admit to me that you have cancer? So you got whatever cancer. Well, no, not me. Could have cancer. Or, no, I don't believe it. Then he can't help you. And the grace would be to say, okay, doctor, you say I have this cancer. Yes. Okay, then what can we do for, for it? Then you get the grace by your admitting the trouble you have, and then the doctor can go further and take care of you. A graceless doctor is a doctor won't tell you nothing. Oh, you're fine. Everything's great. God wants you to acknowledge your disease. It's called sin. And when you acknowledge it, even a saved Christian, I sin. I come to God and say, Lord, patience with red lights. Okay. I'm going to show you grace. I am not going to eliminate the red lights. Just because I acknowledge my sin and I hate red light doesn't mean that I may just come any ride with him at Daytona Beach. Look, not left. He gets more red now than ever. Wait a minute, am I not a child of God? Have I not have not God given me every green light? No. You know why? I'm trying to work on that patience, young man. I do good. I do bad. Then every once in a while he shows me grace. He gives, no. He shows me grace that he says, I forgive you of that sin. And you know what? I love you. I'm trying to help you. Well, I mean, uh, Rachel and Tracy, with Rachel trying to learn a bike, I mean, she fell down and stuff like that. She's about to give up. Tracy's like, I know you guys have fun. You know? All right, you can say you give up. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to tell you not to give up. If you're not going to, if you're not going to give up, I can help you. It may be hard, but once you learn how to do it, then I got the video. She's just riding around around the neighborhood. Grace with Rachel say, you know what? I can't do this, but I need help. And the grace of Tracy is okay. I'll help you. I love you. Uh -huh. And then you get on the bike, and boom. That's what God is for us. Grace is he'll help us when we can't do the help. And no one else can help Tracy went through an ordeal with her medical issues. There was absolutely nothing I could do. It's not like I could go to the park store. And say, uh, yeah, I need a 1968 kidney, a 1968 heart, and can you give me a 1968 elbow for a male? You can't do that. Mm -hmm. And when you got to look at God and say, God, and you're confessing every sin, you can and say, Lord, I, I, I can't do nothing. And this free, unmerited love is... All right, I'll take care of you. I'll help you. 51st birthday. What greater gift to say you're going to get one last day of dialysis? Your husband can't get you that. But then you say, well, what, what, wasn't he there through all that time? Didn't he do the best? If there's one thing that, that he did that you couldn't do, he prayed. Well, I prayed. Well, he prayed his own heart. He loves you. He did. He He's not going to give you a bill. You may get a bill from the doctor, but he ain't going to give you a bill. When is God ever going to say, okay, here's a bill for what Jesus done? That's religion. Religion says, okay, here. Okay, now here's the bill. Well, you just contradicted grace. And what more words the Catholic Church uses And I grew up with? Grace, 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 grace. Pray to Mary. Burn candles. Go to that hotel room booth. That's ridiculous. It says, for God commanded his love toward us that while we were yet sinners, you have to be a sinner to get grace. Romans 3.24. Romans 3.24. So, being a sinner... The, un the free, unmerited love of God, His favor. Being justified, it means 
you are just before a judge. When you walk up to that judge, to the judge, God, he's going to be judged, Jesus Christ. What makes you not guilty in my throne? Jesus, by your blood. Correct. What about these other sins you've got? Oh, the ones you didn't confess. I'm not justified. They're going to burn up as a Christian. Being justified, what's that word? Freely. Free, unmerited love. By His grace, not her grace, but once again, the religion here, through, okay, what's the grace? Through the redemption, buying back, that is in Christ Jesus. Okay, so this verse here, you are justified, it is freely, it's the grace, it's redemption, and it's Jesus Christ, and it is that, His. They are neuterizing God in modern Bibles today. I'm amazing for the people that helped me grow in the ministry. They're showing me on Facebook and others how they neuterize God. I mean, you get your dog sprayed or neutered, they're actually just making God an it. See, when a, I don't know, spray or neuter, they're still a male or female, okay? When they're, when they're getting their scissors with their Bibles today in the modern Bible, they're making God neither male, neither female. Does that sound familiar, what's going on in the world today? I don't know what I, my identity is. That's kind of interesting. They're catching the Bibles up to the age. First they took sin and the blood out. Now the Bible's... You can open up modern Bibles today. I'm not going to tell you the names. You don't need to know. But now you, you can have your new identity in the Bible that's on the market, on the shelves today. So, Hebrews 4.16. I don't like how I write. No. So it has to be 4.16. I got it right there. That looks like a nine. Mm -hmm. Let us. Now Hebrews is written to say Hebrews. Okay. Let us therefore come boldly. Now that's not modulating and look who I am, God, fleshing your muscle. That means are you having a fearful thing in your life right now? Are you scared right now what's going on in your life? Walk up to God. You don't need to be afraid. He's not that big Oz guy with a flaming fire and, you know, going to melt you down. He ain't going to, you know, spit up fire. That means don't go in yourself. Don't go in pride. You're probably say, you know, don't hide behind an angel. Don't hide behind a cherubim. Don't hide behind Mary. Just walk up to God and say, God... Humbly, I get a petition. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of what? What is the, the position of God's throne? Free, unmerited love. And what did John say in 1 John? God is love. That we may obtain mercy. You know what that, that seat in the Old Testament was called and the Ark of the where the cherubim was, was called the mercy seat. In fine grace to help in a time of need, and we saw Paul try that three times. God, are you going through any type of troubles as a Christian? Don't be afraid to walk up and God say, "I need." Paul did it. Now you may not get the answer you want. Paul didn't get it. But is not the free unmerited love of God that He's our Father? Would He not want to explain it? I mean, there have been things my children ask me and I cannot do it. I would sit down and say, this is why I can't do it. Maybe later, but not right now. Sometimes they know is good. Sometimes no is graceful. When you're holding a power cord that's plugged into the wall and you got a pair of scissors, no! That's grace. Because I love you and I don't want to spend the afternoon in the hospital. That's right. 
That's what God is. And when you've got troubles and problems, yes, go up to God. There's that throne of grace. But don't expect Him to always say yes, because that's not graceful. You're only going to ruin the children if you keep saying yes. You're going to spoil them. You're going to make them private. You're going to think everybody open. Is that not the character of today's age? That don't help. But not in how flexing our muscles go into God. That's not what that verse means. That, you know, sometimes we're afraid to go to God. We ought not to be. Sometimes we forget his position on that throne. That throne does not have fire to see. It has thunders and lightning. I would be like, ooh, you won't find me in heaven. Find me at the thunder and lightning. But I'm going to be right there. Because I love a good thunder and lightning storm. That's where I'm going to be. But we need to get by that thunder and lightning. Oh, we need to walk up to God and say, God, i got a petition. And you stand in the same presence where Satan stands. Job 1 and 2 says Satan walks right for God. If he can do it, and he does it boldly, in sin, why can't we walk up to God as sinners saved on the grace of God and say, God, I got trouble? And Paul did it. Maybe sometimes we, we, we think, oh, he's going to tell us no. Maybe that time he'll tell you yes. Or maybe say, you know what, I'll give you the help. No, but I'll help you. Here, have some grace to deal with the problem. That'd be good. He will turn around walking from the grace of God. You've got a pile of grace. Jesus said, if you got burdens, cast them upon me. Trouble, God, bring them to the Lord. Bring them to Jesus. Father may say, okay, son, you take some of that load off that, that, that child of mine, and you carry some of that. I'll lighten that up with a little grace. Titus 2.11. We're going more to just say grace, and that's how the world waters down the message. Titus. Oh. 2.11. Now here's a grace to us, and here's a grace to lost men, if you do what you're supposed to do. Grace. Paul is writing. He says, just before Hebrews, mm -hmm. got a little book called Philemon. Keep going. Mm -hmm. yeah. Keep going. Yep. Keep going. You're on your own. Chapter 2, mm -hmm. verse 11. For the grace of God, that sounds great, what we've been doing, that bringeth salvation. So see, you need grace to be saved. Grace is not worse, remember? That eliminates anything for you to do, okay, but to be saved. The unmerited love of God, I'm saved, has appeared to all men. They say all men got saved. But we are to go into all the world and preach the gospel. When I preach on Saturday mornings the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that grace of God that they hate, some hate, some love it, those that hate it, they're getting the love of God. It's not grace and unmerited love. And people come, oh, you don't have enough love. I'm preaching grace. They don't know what grace is. That's why I'm telling them. Now, I ask you, go out somewhere, like maybe a place like Walmart, somewhere where there's a group of people, and stop any 20 people say, okay, define to me what grace is. And you will get many, I probably guarantee, maybe not so this day and age. Well, we say that at the dinner table. And with our study today of grace, what does saying grace at the dinner table have to do with what we, we just talked about today? You see how Satan has crept in the family in holidays? Mm -hmm. I've, I've had it. I've sat at Thanksgiving meal and they know I'm the preach. Well, I'm not what they, you know, he's the religious preacher. So when you say grace before the same meal, he didn't get it. He didn't get it right. <laughs> but I said, I'll say a thankful prayer. But you want to hear grace? I'll tell you grace. Somebody asks you to say grace, say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. 
and you'll blow them to pieces. That's what it is. Second Peter chapter three, last verse. Second Peter three nine. Just read in Titus 2.11. Tie in 2 Peter 3.9. Why has not the rapture happened? Is that a good question? The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. Didn't He say He's coming? Didn't He say one day He's going to blow that trumpet, the dead in Christ shall rise, and those that are alive. Okay, why has He not done it? I got the answer. Here it is. As some count... As some men count slackness. Uh, well, you didn't hold to your word. You didn't do what you said you were going to do. Uh, you, know, you got late in traffic, couldn't be there today. You know, stuff like that. But is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes him should not perish, but have everlasting life but that all should come to repentance. You know what the grace of God is? Think about it right now. We're saved at this table right now. What if that trumpet blew right now? There's people walking around this park. What if they're not saved? What if they had not had the opportunity to hear? God has not blown that trumpet yet because not all the people, we've already said, He said all. Not everybody's heard the gospel. Not everybody's had the response that God knows they're going to respond. There's someone out there that God knows right now. I don't know when. I'm not going to do the rapture thing or anything like that. But there's someone out there that God knows as soon as they hear the message, they're going to get right. I ain't going to call the rapture right now and have that guy go to hell. I'll be an unholy God. Well, as I said, with Rachel learn how to... What, what Tracy did that? Okay, fine. You, know, you don't want to do it, fine. Don't do it. Don't learn how to ride the bike. Man, you missed out a whole opportunity. We, we want the rapture to happen, but it may not. What if the rapture happened April 20th, 1987? Would I have gone to hell? We need to get busy looking for going all the world and preach the gospel. Yeah, look for the rapture, but also we need to realize that when the rapture does happen, there's going to be people left behind. And the grace of God is the salvation. The grace of God is that we go preach the salvation. We don't get them saved. But at least if they heard, they had an opportunity to reject, and that's their fault. I mean, like I said, I always say this. If the Lord came down and said, I'll give you three wishes, one wish be told, we're gone. The Christians are gone. My dad's lost. Well, what about your dad getting saved? Listen, I've been witnessing to him, I don't know how many years. Since the first day I got saved. He's rejected. That's his own fault. I want the Lord to come. But you know why the Lord hasn't put it into my hands? You know why he hasn't given me those three wishes? Because there are people out there who could get saved. And there are people still getting saved. So the grace of God is right now. Wait a minute. Remember what Paul said? I've got this, this infirmity. I want it. And, God, and God said, no, I'll give you grace. Lord, I want the rapture. No. I'll give you grace to keep going. You keep going. You keep doing. But guess what? I ain't going to give it to you right now. Later. Later. Lord God, may we reflect on what grace. And Lord God, the grace that we have of you, we can carry it to others. And Lord, there are people who charge, and that's not grace. Lord God, I thank you for all that the Lord Jesus Christ has done for me. I thank you, Lord God. My name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Reservations have been paid by the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, there's nothing, absolutely nothing I can do, but Lord, I can do for you because you love me. Help us and build us and strengthen us, Lord. For Jesus' sake, we pray. Amen. Yep.